Hello, a very warm welcome. This is Spectrum on Radio 1. I'm your host, Edmond Chizito. On Spectrum, tonight we are reviewing the way some of the issues we'll be looking at. The Obama-USA-Africa policy. Obama uh, won a second term of office in uh, this week. And just like the first time, there seems to be a lot of expectations from Africa, with many thinking he would do miracles for this continent in his second and final term. Those who understand the USA foreign policy say uh, his hands are tied. We'll be looking at that and what can we expect? What well should we not expect? The scandals at the office of the Prime Minister revelations continue to come in, considering uh, concerning the magnitude of theft and misuse of, of public funds at the office of the Prime Minister, with the latest reports indicating that the First Lady spent 143 million shillings from the Northern Uganda project uh, so she could make eight trips to Israel in one month. Uh, we'll look at that. We'll also look at government's intransigence, failure or refusal to uh, interdict the permanent secretary, Pius Bijirimana, saying he's a whistleblower. Many people think he really should be in charge. He can't be a whistleblower under his own watch. We'll look at that. We'll also look at the acquittal of three ministers. Some could say Jonas, Siram Westgar, Kutana, they've been facing charges of abuse of office and causing a financial loss of 14 billion shillings uh, in preparation for the 2007 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Justice Paul Mugamba, who heads the anti corruption court, said that prosecution had well, to make its case against the three ministers, uh, he also said that uh, it, become, it has become fashionable for government bodies like the IGG to present weak cases before courts uh, wherein they cannot secure convictions. We'll talk about that. Uh, uh, we'll also talk about Somalia. Uganda threatened to pull out of Somalia. The UN gives a mandate until March the 20, March 2030. We'll look at that. Our guests tonight, Honorable Fred Mukasambite, Uganda representative of the East African Parliament. You're most welcome, Honorable Mukasambite. Thank you. Uh, I you, We expect to be joined by Honorable Lydia Wanyoto, two-time Ugandan representative in the same parliament, and Mr. Nicholas Opio, a legal consultant at Archidil, also a non commented on social and political affairs. Honorable Mbide, what's your reading of the kind of policy we can expect from Obama to on Africa? Uh, honestly speaking, I do not find the Obama administration like if they back from the radar of course that they had established. The course that generally was taken for the last four uh, the last four years of his administration. Uh, reasons being one, he is not now worried of any other election. So he's going to be a freer Obama than probably any other Obama we have had. Uh, the anti-racial uh, uh, policies are going to first of all be seen now to be adapted into, into real law, of course, uh, giving their umbilical code from the constitution of the United States. You are now going to see a lot of support uh, for the BAMPAC, the, the, the Black American Police Action Committee, uh, are going to first of all be reinforced. It is not true, however, that the Africa, by way of political pressure, is going to have much from the Obama administration. Unless, uh, because first of all, the substantive policies, the policies laid down by Democrats as an, an ideology do not include too much of war. They include diplomacy by way of either substantive diplomacy or a robust stance, but they don't usually go beyond that. It, it is very unlikely that uh, a, a democrat will definitely, for example, result in power change, power, power, power changes the way it appeared in Libya. You, you saw even his actions during the Libya war. Uh, I think that is what he was very said. guarded, very hesitant. Yeah, compared to Republican compared Bush, who hit Iraq <laughs> like it was his back. In fact, even Condoleezza Rice, when, when she was trying to critique the Obama administration, she really said that, well, America should not keep allies wondering what their position is. <laughs> and, and because that is usually what the Obama administration does. But then, we are going to look at a lot of life improvement in the United States. Uh, we are going to look at a lot of uh, government participation in, in, industry, in, 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 in the creation of jobs, in the provision of, provision of uh, social uh, services. Uh, the Obama care is now going to be strengthened into substantive structural policy, and, uh, of course, which was a bit shaky, but now it is going to be strengthened. And now that they have controlled the Senate, definitely, which is a, a, an organ of, of which has powers, the 
equivalent of veto powers of, of legislation. I, I can I, I can expect uh, first of all the uplift because he, he, uh, the ideology of the Democrats is that that looks at it does not support persons with millions. It supports millions of persons wanting to make it. So you see, that is the difference. It's and, and pro poor. It is pro poor. They, they look at the majority wanting to. In fact, we can call it trade democracy. They, they look at several persons having the capacity to trade between themselves than having few persons trading heavily to the extent that they can employ others. Uh, in terms of employment, for example, we were looking at Romney saying 12 million jobs will be created uh, under his term of office of four years. But with the, of course, the, with the tax cuts that he was also proposing, it was speculative in nature. The speculation is that once you cut a tax, an entrepreneur or industrialist will definitely now obtain some certain profits and employ more people. But, but we are looking at taxing them, those with millions, for purposes of providing services to those without. And I think that is what the Democrats look at. They, they can even look, from the onset, they can look like similar parties. But in most cases, they are not. Uh, in fact, Mwarim Nyerere, one time when he was asked why he's running a one-party state, he told the, the Americans that even you, you are running one, a one-party state. The only difference is that you have broken that one party into two. So... One political party in the U.S. broken into two. <laughs> broken into two. So, right. so that was his argument. Uh, when you look at them, they, they are just like two governments trying to each propose a substantive policy, contrary to the other. So, whereas, of course, these are different uh, matters that people must be addressing when it comes to the African set up. Well, some people thought this election actually divided Americans. It was a bit polarizing. Some people have said that it was closely run, but the issues went a little bit deep to the extent of possibly a Romney could not would not concede immediately. He had to wait a little while. Do you think it divided? This them? was the first mm -hmm. Obama election in the real nature of an election. Uh, Obama came up as a candidate at a time when the United States had started fidgeting against the animosity throughout the world towards America. They had started doing a lot of work. Embassies had started flagging even then the Washington film throughout all, say, all, all entities. They were showing them to universities, indicating that actually the American society should be a lovable society. And, and you see, Start to peer it was a time promoting America. when now PR was the order of the day. So it was easier for Obama to be elected. Two, there must be now, a, there had to be a difference between a leader who looks for war, or who solves the problems by way of war, and thereby of course increasing, increasing public expenditure, and a leader now who is looking at provisions for social services. So Obama became a candidate who was extremely accidental, and, and anyway, he was, he was to be supported. This is the only Obama that has now been elected, and I can assure you he has been elected for personal furtherance, but now it is an opinion poll. The numbers are now clear. Between those Americans that have got a Jewish origin and the Americans that are substantive, typical immigrants. And, and I can assure you, if this is not a sub... Because it is, a, it, it is either by way of a mixture of immigrants and of course the younger generation, which includes the black, of course, and the Spaniards and the, all those old. As if it is not the case, then there is going to be a problem. A Republican problem might not make it for a very long period of time. You think so? Unless mistakes are made that are clear. Gross mistakes. Well, listeners, this is Petra Morigi. You want to just been joined by our second guest, uh, Mr. Nicholas Opio, a legal consultant at Akiju. That's the name of the firm. He's also a commentator on political and social affairs. You're most welcome, uh, Mr. Nicholas Opio. Well, thank you very much. And first, uh, my sincere apologies. I've spent the last hour trying to make it here. To the I, I think yeah. the Honorable MP has a lead car. Police sirens must have cleared way for him. So I'm terribly, I'm terribly sorry. I'm always embarrassed to be late, and uh, my sincere apologies. Well, you almost are never late. And talk to us about this uh, U.S. election. Obama comes b back in the first black American, black Amer black American to be elected president. He's won an ele a, a, a re-election. What kind of policy can we expect to see from him this time? Well, first, I think it is it is foolhardy for any African leader or state to expect so much from Barack Obama simply on account of his ancestral uh, you know, background. I mean, if the last four years are anything to go by, he only came to Africa once. 
and went twice, I think. He was in Egypt and in, 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 in he was that was a, a one trip. trip. One trip. He only came here once. Right. I mean that tells you uh, because first and foremost, Obama is an American leader, not an African leader. And I think that substantive American foreign policy in regards to African states may not change as much. I mean if you watch the last debate with Mitt Romney, they nearly agreed on foreign policy. I think Africa was only mentioned twice. <laughs> You know? Well, but Africa is and really a small each, continent. Each time Africa is mentioned was in reference to the death of the ambassador in, uh, in Benghazi, in Libya. Mm -hmm. Nothing was mentioned about the Egypt situation, the Mali situation, or what is happening in the Ivory Coast. Absolutely nothing. Or even our, our own subcontracting war in, uh, in Somalia. No. It does speak to the fact that Obama is an American president. An American foreign policy in regards to Africa will only be rigorous in regards to the fight against terrorism. The only African army base is actually based in Germany. <laughs> Supposed to monitor the African continent and fight terrorism is based in Germany. So the U.S. engagement with Africa, in my view, will likely continue to be the same and will majorly focus on issues of terrorism, looking for partners, even dictators, as long as they are willing to fight American war and terror, they, are, you know, <laughs> they will still ally with them. You know. So all of this, but also more importantly, I think the Bush PEFA program is going to continue the overall commitment to the HIV AIDS, uh, TB and malaria causes will continue but largely Americans involvement will be on issues of terrorism if you ask me what I would wish America to focus on of course those are important issues but I think that as a global player American and indeed the world interest is best served by having a more democratic African state. African state, we must begin to focus more on having more democratic African states. We can't keep having people, I mean, countries like Ghana and you know and Botswana as few examples of thriving democracies. When all over across the continent you have dictators who have stayed in power. In fact, some of them have stayed in power longer than over five heads of states in America. I was speaking to an American and I told him, I said, look. President Seven has been in power since Ronald Reagan. He was outraged that there could even be a situation like that in Africa. So I think America must focus largely, in my view, on democratizing Africa, urging more on human rights, and then providing the African people it really with, with, with the knowledge to be able to, 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 to play a role in their governance. But also, more importantly, there are now global discussions about trade. Many of you have followed trade discussions in the Cancun discussions, all of these World Trade negotiations. These are important negotiations that will impact on the, an ordinary farmer in the villages in Uganda. I've seen Uganda fumbling with what they call an Indications Act, indications to protect local, you know, uh, local goods, you know. And, and I think that we've done a poor job at that. What I want to see is an equal trade relation between the West and the East, because if you don't have that, we are still going to remain in. I mean, exporters of raw material. We are still going to remain uh, consumers of Western products. We still import toothpicks from China. And, and uh, uh, just, just, yeah, just sure. uh, in addition, you look at the symbols of corporate governance in Uganda, including. I do not wish to mention names of companies, <laughs> but, but then we have got big supermarkets here dealing in, 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 in mangoes. And, uh, <laughs> pineapples. And and mangoes pineapples. And we call that for indirect investment. <laughs> you, you, that is now a problem. I remember when there was one time Walmart wanted to buy into mass mart in South Africa. It was a very huge debate. There's a big debate. And they were saying, no, there is no way a foreign direct investment can operate here with an investment in, within the food sector. We cannot allow it. This must be an indigenous based investment. In Uganda here, we have people <laughs> importing mangoes, apples, and when we have soil. And oranges. And oranges. As our own rotting and so There are yeah. people of corporate governance here and, and business, mushrooming, and the foreign direct investment. Well, but that really <laughs> is Africa for you. Okay, we'll come back to that a little bit. That's an extremely important point. But first so, but some people say that Obama effectively stands itself from Africa because he wanted to underline his credentials basically as an American person, but now he has nothing to lose. He's going to come to Africa, go to Kogelo. Well, you see, the point is not about Obama the person, it's about America the state. Okay? And, and, and I think that it is, it, is, it is rather naive to imagine that Obama now has nothing to lose. No. Obama is only the face of a very powerful machinery. 
Don't forget that the U.S. Senate, I mean, sorry, the, the U.S. Congress, Congress is Republican. 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 It's Republican. You only control the Senate. There are, there are even domestic issues Obama might get, I mean, find difficulties passing. There were threats to his health care law, you know that. America is now facing the biggest, what they call a financial cliff by the beginning of 2013 if they don't fix certain things, if they let the Bush taxes expire. So I think that there are more important and pressing issues in the U.S. to attend to than really God says distant Kagelo issues and, and all the sense. Really, it's just sentiments. Our attachment to Obama is just sentimental. Because his election, take it or leave it, is historic. For the very first time, an African-American is able to sit in the White House. You know, it's, it's historic. So our connection to America and Obama is merely sentimental. Beyond that, I don't see much in terms of what will change in American American uh, relations. Why, 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 why Africans are, are taking it as a very huge? It's a lack of heroes back home, so <laughs> you, don't I mean, sure. you can't study the history of, of, of the United States without studying the history of immigration. <laughs> yes. Well, so it's, it's an immigrant community. You know, Obama is just one of those, but yeah. everybody there is an immigrant. And, and Except a few Red Indians. Of course, uh, but very few. Very, 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 <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, the kind of <laughs> yeah, let, let's look at. I mean, let's look at. The, let's put this thing in conflict. When people ignore Africa, really, you can't quite blame them. Africa is less than one percent of the U.S. economy, for example. We contribute less than two percent of the world's GDP, and uh, you know we have all this dictatorship. We look like more or less the backyard country cousin. You would like him, but tolerate him and keep him at a distance. Nicholas, how do we get out of that rut? Oh, you see, the thing is, nobody should ignore Africa. First, if you ignore us, we become a bedrock for terror and dictators like we had, which is a, a much more bigger threat to world peace. Okay? Secondly, Africa represents the only hope for fertile investments across the globe. I mean, if you go to Latin America, beyond oil, it's, it's pretty much exploited. If you go to the East, Africa is still the only virgin continent, the only source of, 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 of immense riches. Talk of the Congo, talk of Uganda, talk of all African South countries. Sudan. All of these countries have a very important bearing on the global market in terms of industrialization, in terms of even powering American or Western uh, industries. They look to Africa. It is therefore no wonder that in, I took a flight from Geneva coming. I was, I think well, I was only one of the four black men on the plane, on an Airbus. They were all white people coming down here for opportunities. Africa represents a virgin place for investment, and therefore they should take it very seriously. To ignore Africa is to miss an opportunity. I, I mean, I, 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 I would argue that Africa occupies a central place in world affairs, and we therefore must take it as part of part of the world. Honorable Bidia, what lessons have we drawn from? Well, you wanted to say something. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> I would like, like to know what lessons you think we can draw from the American elections. Oh, yeah. Uh, first of all, the American election is going to dominate the best on American interests. And, and I think uh, for the first time, I think African leaders should begin now to generalize, to generally identify what our current and future interests are within the global political and economic equation. I am raising this because even when we obtain such help, like for example an enactment under the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which is an open door. So otherwise, what would have been quotas for us to export okay, yes. to an American market? Mm -hmm. You discover that that principle was abused. You know, that the principle of, 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 uh, of foreign direct investment, when we are now the investor yes. in the equation, should be that we do not accept foreign direct investors within in an area where we have got a direct access to a foreign market. That should have been the principle. We quickly invited what we call the Pakistanis to begin using their poor market. He's not a diplomat. Yes, instead of becoming a stopover, it's just a roundabout <laughs> and an opposed investment. Then, too. Nepal, for example, when the Africans decided that now we must be, we are now done with donations, we want now trade partnerships, then what we expected was that we would now have product lists within countries established. A country that is predominantly agriculturalist, for example, like Uganda, what is our product list? I 
once asked people, why is it that by 1962 our economy was growing almost at the same rate as that of Great Britain, a country whose size is ours? It was because we had a product list, we had zoning, we knew that tobacco is from West Nile. We, but now we have nuts, where every house is given a, a goat, and you wonder who will sell it to the other. <laughs> so we do not have a product list for any particular region, for example. If you are looking for a market, for example, if you are looking for the production of mangoes, or oranges, or bananas, there is no particular region you must drive to. If, if you want a bunch of bananas, you must drive 48 districts in order to have a, a lorry food. Meaning, a banana then will have a cumulative a price level compared to the amount of fuel you have. You have <laughs> and those bananas now cost 40,000. We are not a market and we cannot even be a production uh, a producer because we have no product list. Now, it is going to be a very big problem if we, uh, we plan our economies by steel. The president goes to northern Uganda telling people to grow Whatever. On his return, he talks of vanilla. But you see, everything <laughs> takes around three months. All right. I'll go for a break. We'll be back. This is Spectrum Radio. You understand? <laughs> uh, Sava, Sava, hello. Uh, my name is Kogole Andemina. Very serious Congolese tailor. People see me when they want to look good. People leave my shop looking like superstars of TV. But however much I make you look beautiful or even sexy like me, <laughs> I cannot change the person inside. The real you. Kind of like Uganda Waraji. It has this beautiful look, uh, but inside they have maintained the same old spirit that we know. The same old spirit we have known for many years in a new suit. Uh, uh, sorry, new look. <laughs> oh, you need to try it. Enjoy the new look Uganda Waraji. The same Ugandan spirit with a new look. Uganda Waraji. Same spirit. New look. Excessive consumption of alcohol is harmful to your health. Not for sale to persons under 18 years. Please drink responsibly. Uh, excuse me, guys. Let me through, please. Yes. Chick, chick, this guy. Goodness, dude, what are you doing? Get real. Just, just move a little. What? A little bit. Man, wha what are you doing bringing a cow into the sitting room? It's just for when I want milk. Just what? Just please move. Just let it come and sit here. What's wrong with this guy? You cannot keep a cow in your home, but you can get the freshness of its milk straight from the farm into your home. Get fresh diary milk for freshness straight from the farm every day. Fresh diary. So fresh. Spectrum on Radio 1 FM 90. Welcome back on Spectrum. Tonight we review the week. We've been looking at the Obama USA Africa policy. Will it change? Some people, well, the general opinion seems to be, well, very little is going to change. We're now going to look at the scandals at the office of the Prime Minister. The first lady's name comes up. They say she made eight trips to Israel in one soup. But people have been forging signatures there. Could they have forged signatures, assuming she traveled when she actually did not? About 143 million shillings was spent during that trip. Properties have been seized. We'll look at that. We'll also look at the acquittal of three ministers. Why do we indict innocent people, people who never stole even a coin and instead work really, really hard for us to host? The Queen, our guests, we can now sue the state of Uganda for malicious persecution. They, they think they are going to sue. Our guest tonight, Honorable Fred Mukasambi, the Ghana representative of the East African Parliament, uh, Mr. Nicholas Sapi, a legal consultant at Aki Jill, also commented on political and social issues. This scandal at the office of the Prime Minister, the First Lady's name has been sucked in. What do you think is actually happening in that place? Yeah, this is the well particular about the first lady and then this is not the first time that their names have been sucked into. Usually what you need to look at is whether there is goodwill to fight corruption in Uganda. Uh, goodwill is a very important matter. And until you experience it practically, you, you cannot really get to terms with it. I can give you an example. During Congo, Zaire. The roads minister then visited the roads, the roads minister of Rwanda. It, it is written somewhere, and they were exchanging the 
their secrets. The road minister, the road minister of Rwanda would tell the one of Burundi that he said for me, on the other road, I ate six centimeters from each side. So that a road is passed and all that the minister eats corruptly is the size of the road <laughs> by at least some centimeters. Yes. Uh, in Uganda, of course, they eat layers. So we have got, uh, we have got roads with just one layer. But the Congolese man told him that, hey, you ate what? You come and visit me also. So the Congolese minister also took him and showed him around, uh, around a bush and said, me, I ate the whole of that road. Now there was no road. So he said, but which one? I, said, I ate it. It was supposed to pass there. Now in Uganda, corruption is, has reached a level in such a way that in, in politics and administration, truth is so precious that it has to be guarded by a pack of lies. Can I show you during the truth is so precious, so you have to guard it with many, many lies. Guarded by a pack of lies. During the Gavi, the Gavi Santa. Yes. I can assure you, there, 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 was, there was an inquiry. And one of the ministers was, was interrogated. There was a, an expedi a, a transfer of one million dollars. Then there was a transfer of 340 million Uganda shillings. So, of course, the transfers would indicate where the money were going to. So, those interrogating said, ask the minister, Minister, why, where did this 380 something Uganda million shillings go? The minister said, No, why do you ask? Why do you begin with this one? You first ask me, Where did the one million go? The one, one million dollars. dollars. Because it was going above. So, you see, there is no good way. Look at a country like Rwanda. The good of it is to fight corruption in living it. One of the biggest businessmen in Rwanda recently donated a vehicle, brand new, to the mother of the president of Rwanda. And in three hours, the president had gotten to know about it. Now, that businessman had been a very close friend of the president before he became president. From, from long ago. So the president called the businessman. He said, now you have given that vehicle to my mother. But he said, we have been together for long. And you have never given, never given a bicycle to my mother. Are you trying to bribe me to my mother? So he said, he told him that if you were not my friend, I would have told you to carry that vehicle on your head and take it back. <laughs> so please go and drive it away from the court At full speed. Mind. So that is what we are talking about. A president that has the goodwill and is the beginning, the fountain of anti-corruption. In Uganda, we don't have such a leader. And there is going to be a problem. In Kenya, where corruption was almost the order of the day, the goodwill of government has started changing a lot of issues. There is a full-fledged anti-corruption commission. All appointments are done after public hearings. Whoever has even a debt, whoever is even having a privacy by way of, 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 of a divorce petition, you cannot be given a job. <laughs> Whoever has had any misgiving anywhere, <laughs> you cannot now be appointed. <laughs> so in Uganda, if we want to fight corruption, it cannot be a decision of God. It's not going to be a, it is going to be a complete overhaul. So that all those pointed out, because all these are issues. Comrade, what I want you to look at is the end of such investigations. Because here there is an excitement. Well, but the truth eventually comes out. You know very well these people, the, the, the Chogam scandal, they've been acquitted. Eventually the truth reigns. <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> Is that <laughs> true? I like the sarcasm in my mind. So I can assure you, here we have got, and even those trying to raise out corruption tendencies and all act, act, uh, actions related to corruption, and all those producing reports, all those dealing with inquiries, politicians, they all make front page utterances for a period of time within which they keep quiet during the subsistence of the corrupt tendency and even when the money itself has not been returned. So, there is a lot of corruption. They could do this absence. We need to 
just three things. We collect our salary, we do an amendment, establish a substantive schedule on corruption and our constitution, and we have to lose the rating to that. The IGG cannot do any work. But there is hope. There's this big uh, scan, you know, this big investigation, which is that nothing big. Names. Yeah, that hope is, is like, you know, the Indians say that things will be better in the end. <laughs> That for any one time you think things are not yet better, then you know it is not yet the end. <laughs> Unless you are an optimist. Like an <laughs> All right. Well, somebody has said, obviously, I, I heard this the other day, somebody has said that if you want to remove uh, poverty from this country, we should, or at all universities, we should introduce a new faculty called the Faculty of Ghost Education so we can produce the ghost workers because they are paid in billions. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas, how do you get out of this trap? Well, I can't claim to have to have a solution to this to this problem, but 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 uh, just just to highlight a couple of things that are being done. Uh, a couple of civil society organisations have organised what they call a Black Monday. You, you're supposed to wear black. You're supposed to. That's on Monday at Hotel Africa, I believe. No, no, no. You converge at I mean at the Uma 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 ground Yes. To express our outrage to not just the opium scandal. Give us some detail on that. Probably we need to know it. Well, I'm not part of the organisation, but I've received communication. I'm going to wear a black t-shirt where I mean I'm go barefoot. <laughs> barefoot? Yes. To protest the theft in public offices in Uganda. People will show up in Lugogo walking barefoot? Well, come come and witness. Come and black. witness. Many organizations are closing offices on Monday and leaving at their gates placards and banners saying this must stop. Such commitment. For me the problem is and it's not just the OPM office, because I think the OPM scandal, in my view, is the biggest scandal that affects President Museveni as a person. What do you mean? His name has not shown up at all. His name may not have to show up. But First of all, his wife, yeah. his wife is involved. Her name has come up. Secondly, it is the ministry headed by a person that he has for endless times accelerated in public and said this man is spotless clean clean white so it's about his credibility it's about how the public will view president seven and how his word against i mean his word will be second guess next time so it's the biggest scandal in my view that affects president seven as a person but also thirdly because <laughs> this is the headmaster of prime ministers so if the center is that rotten what happens to the other ministries but for me, head like, of ministry. Yeah, he's, he's the head of the ministers. He's the chief minister. He's supposed to supervise all the other ministers. He has in his office over seven ministers. You know, of eight states. actually. Eight. Eight. So, so, substantive minister. Exactly. So you can imagine the magnitude of that ministry. So it's huge. But that is only symptomatic of the problem that is across the board in this government. And Ugandans really forget quickly. Next week, another scandal will break out. We will forget about the Just like we forget, we forgot the idea. We will. We forget the bicycles. bicycles, we forget IDs, we forget all sorts of theft. The amount of money put together is actually more than the overall budget for the country for 10 years. Stolen. I have been adding up these figures. There is no collective outrage to this sort of theft. And I think Ugandans must begin to react. Yes, there was a case at the Uncorruption Court. But when I went out, my client made a comment which amused me. Mm. He told me that this is the court for the educated. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? No. <laughs> that almost all those uh, and uh, white collar jobs will show up here. Certainly, <laughs> so that this is not a court for chicken thing for what it is the court now. For the court robbers. You can imagine. So for me, my cry to all Ugandans is that where is the outrage? Well, but they were touched these people's properties. Uh, you know, Conrad Plaza. It cost uh, several million dollars. One what man have, bought. What have lunch. they done about junk helicopters? What have they done about the bicycle scandals, the national ID scandals? Where is the outrage? Because Let me when just show you. Uh, how corruption affects even our our contributions and and, and uh, of course our own operations as a country. Yes. Let us look at what happened in Somalia, especially during this my decision, because it was decided that Ethiopia and Kenya, would, because it's Mayo became, of course, the last resort for the Al Shabaab, and of course there was now a final attack against them. So you, Kenya and, and Ethiopia were given to attack using ground forces. Uganda was supposed to attack using air cover, and 
the Uganda be fronted. So now all. our airplanes took off yes. and never landed properly. The one that landed never fall. <laughs> now you you can imagine it's because of corruption that right. we can't even do what we can do best. Because this government was credited for doing the best in security. Yes. But that security measure now has corruption has stepped in. Yes. You know, remember there was a time we, we had an exhibition of uh, APCs on yes. one of the Independence Day. Yeah. Three days. We were told some of the APCs did not even start. Oh, really? <laughs> Others got stuck along the way. Maybe, the, battery, were maybe the batteries were full. <laughs> <laughs> so, even security itself now. So, it, corruption is eating into security, potentially. It has eaten into all the. We might wake up and find that the jets don't have engines. <laughs> the engines were sold, they're exported. So, for me, when they tell me that this vehicle of the president has costed $2 billion, now I'm only waiting to see it on the road. Of course, I've not seen it since then. <laughs> it has remained a matter of the newspaper. What but do you mean? See, you think something might be stolen from it? I want to see it starting. <laughs> because you think that is the, that is the level <laughs> where we have it. <laughs> when his car goes well, But in, in, in Kawempe, <laughs> let's talk about you, you, you brought it all up. Security implications brought about by corruption. In Kawempe, some two policemen set up a counterfeit police station yeah. in their uniforms. We have have counterfeit banks. We had the jungle dogs. Even jungle dogs. <laughs> you know, we had the dog brought at the airport property. <laughs> counterfeit dogs with cocaine. It, it, it actually got hold of the one holding it. The policeman also. <laughs> Because it was a junk dog also. <laughs> <laughs> that is terrible. The plot stickers. This is Petra Radio. Hardware we're doing the way tonight. We've just been joined by our third guest. It's really, really hilarious tonight from Honorable Mkasambida. Honorable Lydia, Nyoto has just joined us. He's a two-time Uganda uh, representative at the East African. Well, but you're most welcome, Honorable Wanyoto. Good evening. Uh, listeners, I'm really sorry I'm late, but like... The traffic. <laughs> I had to be slow to cover hands. So, so you uh, uh, apologizing. It's really bad out there. Uh, I don't know even with the lady car whether <laughs> MBJ would have made. I think he just uh, walked his way here. I have no idea that MBJ. He must have walked. There is no way even with the lady car. He must have walked on. MBJ has so many tricks. Let's talk about corruption in the video. No, me, I'm tired about talking about corruption. I want to begin by Let's talking about the weather. <laughs> I wanted to say, I listened to my colleagues as I came here, Edmond. I think there is a lot to learn from the U.S., even with the issue you've talked about of immigrants. You know, you know why I sometimes get so passionate about Uganda, and I, I almost want to give up, is that we, are, we as a country, even as a people, maybe we don't know, we have not yet been hit by the war. I sometimes don't sound sarcastic. If we've been pushed to the war, like um, black Americans were, you, you become so determined, you stop lamenting, and you can walk through a concrete wall. I don't know whether we have vision. Maybe we are reaching there one by one. Because there are things that we can do as Ugandans and say, this must come to a stop and things will come to a stop. We can get what we want. And that's the lesson we, learn, we should learn from America. Is that the that, that, in Lugogo on my that they, they want to have a... An, an Obama for presidency, they worked at it, they, they, there was a disbelief in reality that they fought so hard, and when you heard they even cried with emotion. So that's where we should be going. But in Uganda, we can acquire here, then we go and have tea, then some people don't sleep hungry. Even though they are hungry, they can have food for tomorrow. We must really begin demanding for what is owed to Ugandans. If we don't do that, and I know the focus is so much on the leaders, but come to the 16th, we shall vote the same leaders. So are we in here? Yeah! Sure. Let me tell you what I think I'm talking to de debate the issues of uh, of corruption in Uganda. I can tell this because I've been part of the electoral process in Uganda. I've been following election. I can't have that I'm a, I like electoral processes. But you, I'm amazed at the way, if not the administrative structures, if not the moral fiber within us, that many people that lose office, public office, because of interdiction or anything, they end up in parliament. Yeah. I promise you, as they follow the night, all these guys that you're running after, they'll go for the for the and big and they take big offices. So it, it is very disheartening. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so for me, <laughs> I, 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 I want, I want to say that we will learn a lot from from America because America sets standards. Look at the whether they whether they practice their family values or not. For campaigns, for them, it's a value to parade their families and the value of their wealth. Uh, 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 the family, you might not have. So, 
and 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 the the correct line doesn't begin with only money. It begins with how you manage your body, how you manage your character, and how manage you how you cheat on yourselves. Because it begins with you one another. Then you go. So when when you saw Mitt Romney and um, Barack Obama, his grandchildren, bring their families to the podium to campaign with them, and that's a value system. And until we sat down and said, and said, look, we must list our value system. This is how far you can go. All right. Let's move on. Three cabinet ministers, Sam Kutesa, John Nasasra, Mwes Gwarukutana, they come from a certain part of the country. They've been facing charges of abuse of office and causing financial loss of 14 billion shillings ahead of the 2007 Chogam meeting. Court set them free. Horrible Mekasambide. Our justice system is working, isn't it? Yes, My My partner president one time when he was in the parliament, in the sixth parliament, said that the problem with the corruption in Uganda, with the fight against corruption in Uganda, is that the standards of proof are so high that it is very hard for you to catch the corruption in the real attic. Uh, he, he decided that corruption should be treated like adultery. Yes. That it is very rare that you find the culprits in the real act. <laughs> But, so, but, so you look at the incident. So, so we must now, the standard of proof should now be different <laughs> for purposes of corruption. You just detect in accordance to the conduct of the the, 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 the character. You watch the court to You find the, 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 the culprit tying his shoelaces. You find him half naked. You just conclude that adultery has taken place. So, so it is now very hard. Because corruption is a machine. Uh, the machine of corruption does not even only start from the top. It is so sophisticated that you even need... Where does it start? It doesn't ask for me. Where does it start? The sides. The, the top are usually those that cut the tape. I, I, I've already seen people cutting the tape, opening this road, and people clapping. And you look at... There are a lot of people clapping for several reasons. Others have cleansed the hill. Others have... Uh, and others had promised voters. Others, but people are cl clapping for particularly different reasons. It's only those viewing the registration that have also different perceptions of the matter over the matter. Yes. But now corruption is so sophisticated. It requires forensic proof. There must be some kind of forensic capability for you to prove a corruption. Well, they're doing, they've, they've been attaching properties, layers on insurance and other and Conrad action, Plaza. Action has no boundaries. What do you mean? Those prosecuting are they self. They are also ministers in some way. Appointed those prosecuting to begin with. So, did they, did they, were they appointed? Given, because an appointment is an award of the job. I am looking at a scenario where your house girl now begins to be the ombudsman. <laughs> Explain that. That's very sophisticated. Explain it to us. I am looking at a situation where a man who struggled for a job and one man awarded that job is given a task of imprisoning that. The person who gave you the, the job? The person who gave you the job offers not any matter that, which does not in effect even affect him as a person himself. So we have a problem. That is why. Matters has find themselves uh, before court without the substantive arguments that are capable of winning them. We know that affidavits get lost from the files. We know that lawyers are given substantive uh, different instructions. We have had the matters before court where the attorney general has given instructions that somebody should concede. We have so the society is not safe. Who is fighting corruption? Well, tonight we we'll we'll have only lawyers in the house. <laughs> Mr. Nicholas Sopio, yeah. well, at least we know you're practicing yeah. right now. This man is in, is in Arusha. This well, lady is here. He's he's still waiting for the from court. <laughs> oh, he's just been in court. Talk about it. Yeah. Talk to us about uh, this. Uh, why do we indict innocent people in this car? Where is our country going? These well, ministers well, were innocent, but we paraded them before court. Yes, just to give you information that has just been brought to my attention, that their wives and spouses we are shopping yesterday and inviting people for parties today. Before the judgment? Before judgment, so you can, can tell you that they expect... Why did they go win. shopping? Well, they were shopping for party, you know, party things, you know, to, to celebrate what was a pre-announced, a pre, a pre -announced, I think... Uh, Maybe an angel spoke to them. Go on. But, but the point that I want to make, and I see everybody's tired about speaking about corruption, corruption, corruption. And you see, 
when I went to Geneva, I did speak to a Ugandan lady working at the Global Fund Secretariat. You know, she used to work for the AIDS Commission. She's called Sarah. She's she's terribly embarrassed to be working there. Because each time she goes for a meeting, she's holding her head down, and you know, she's very embarrassed about Uganda. So this this whole corruption thing. And then see, I believe in a fair trial. I believe in justice process. I mean, due process. We saw justice today. Okay. But I think that what is happening is a facade. It's a waste of our time. And poor Sidney Asubo is a good friend of mine, excellent lawyer. He must be terribly frustrated at what is happening. I mean, all of you who watch this thing unfold must have known that there could only be one result. Government employees who had either to confided in the IGG that money is were stolen, turn up in court and say actually nothing happened. You had a whole lineup of people going before the court, the PS, you know, Mr. Onen, Ambassador Onen, you had all of these guys going to court and turning up to be defense witnesses. Well, in fact, they are prosecutor witnesses. They even dragged the whole judge to go and testify. <laughs> and he went to testify. So you can imagine the extent of this, of this, of this, right. of this smoke screen thing. And I think we had better screen. stop wasting time. For me, I think we've got to become a little bit more harder. And because see, even the judges are lamenting. All right. <laughs> the head of the court lamented in the very same manner Justice Katusi, before his retirement, yes. lamented. You have to be in that court to All see right. how silly this play is. All I right. think it must stop, must stop fully in Uganda. Honorable Lydia Wanyoto, is our justice still? What, what do you, how do you rate it? Is it watertight? Or do you think, like Nicholas thinks, there are loopholes? I, I think, uh, you know, being in the East African community, you, you benefit. At least you have a broader perspective and you, you compare. Uh, practices in our country. In uh, in Kenya, uh, Tanzania, and Rwanda, you do not. You, they don't only use the law to 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 say or not public funds uh, got lost under your signature and hand. The, 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 it is the law plus. It is the law plus. If 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 you are appointed in a, a public office, the, of course your rights will be protected by the law. But if it is proved whether or not you signed a document or a check, if it is proved under your leadership, money is belonging to public uh, activities or for service delivery got lost under your your your, your you leadership, to touch a shilling? then you will be held to account. Oh, so you it's an issue, not, not an issue of, of touching. It's an issue of custody. If I have a farm of 1,000 cows, let me give an example, because, because cows are normally, and now this is a common thing under even nerds and stuff. Yes. If, if you are my manager at the farm, and uh, tomorrow 700 cows have gotten lost, I'll not begin chasing the smell of the cows in where they have gone. I'll hold you the manager accountable, even when there is no single cow in your home state. Really? Because you are the manager. So you think the, 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 I am not thinking the anything. I'm only laying the I am not thinking anything because you you will not take us away from the No, <laughs> you will not get anybody that went to school and knows accounting systems and is able to access the custody of public funds using the court system Uganda is using. You will not because I'll not be so stupid also to get a billion of public funds or under my custody and begin signing documents or begin is but why not receive money from heaven? <laughs> so anyway, you listen to me. So I'm saying that because of the experience of our part of our of our neighbors, Rwanda, Kenya, and Tanzania, they've gone beyond proving you whether you signed a document here, whether uh, the, there was a witness who saw you there, whether money was wired officially to your account. They've gone beyond that. We appointed you to head this sector. It has been proven that money got lost. They will not go beyond to ask how it got lost. They will tell you you failed go the home. responsibility, and therefore, actually, you go to prison because money got lost under your care and property. So th that's one. Number two, if you are not a, a factory owner like Mukwano, you don't manufacture soap for sale. You don't. You, you, you are not an exporter. A known exporter. Oh, you you don't don't talking cows. about mangoes. <laughs> you don't sell many cows to South Sudan or milk. Some of them. 
Yeah. No, you will be always followed. There is an intelligence system that works in this country. We are a civil society, by the way. For Kenya, not even intelligence. It is civil society. Some man in the city will walk and say, ask Wanyoto to account for the building on Kampai Road. Because being a member of parliament, a minister, she does not have any money that is related to that building. So they come, they come and ask, when we appointed you, you never had this building on Kampala Road. Can you account for the source of this? If you don't have a bank loan, if you don't have uh, inherited the property, uh, uh, or you're not, uh, the money didn't come from heaven. Yeah, then, then really, it it goes to to public coffers without any question. We don't have that in Uganda, and therefore, I would like to say, for me, I have stopped discussing issues of corruption. I think we need to get back to the institutions like the IGG and the Auditor General to advise government, and even it's a political decision, by the way, even Parliament and and the executive to say how else people that uh, are held uh, are, are given custody to public resources if they get if they it is found that money lost left an account an official account yes and it did not go for the intention to which it was put on that account did not reach the delivery points then the question not say I did not touch it then who touched it and where is it so that there must be a mechanism beyond the law all right well. and, and it can be within the rules of administration it can be, be, be between the, your oath of office it, there must be something while you're in that office right. beyond saying you know me I did not sign this check uh, this much I didn't know uh, those, those are things that oh, you cannot and, 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 and it is a practice I want to emphasize this we are in the African community to learn good practices and to style up so we cannot begin using only the courts of law and people go away happy because now we are, we, we, we are going to put people in a position to look at our, our, our system like it is fake but it is law plus okay. so these people are not only innocent but they are beyond reasonable doubt innocent and okay. whatever they have is not beyond uh, reproach we have to go so we have a uh, half a minute 15 seconds within 15 seconds because really this is a moral issue also why is it that there is no fear by those that are corrupt what do you mean <laughs> why are they fearing anyone for example they don't look scared. You know, the, the, the West African say that when mother cow is eating, the young ones are also observing to see the movement of the young. We have to go. Thank you very much, Dida. Yes, Honorable Fred Mukasambi, the Ghana Reserve of the South African Parliament. Thank you for coming to Spectrum. Very hilarious comments from that side. Honorable Lydia, when you're the Ghana Reserve of the South African Parliament, she's now tired of talking corruption. We don't know what the topic is going to be. Mr. Nicholas Opi, a legal consultant at Akijas. Thank you for tuning in. Baba Blachi. Thank you for tuning in. I've been your host, Ed Monty. The Spectrum will be back on Monday. Have a very blessed weekend. <laughs> it's the time again to sweat a little for better.